Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. Story time. I'll never forget the events that unfolded during my time as a Navy SEAL in Iraq. People may doubt the supernatural, but I swear on my honor that what I'm about to recount is as real as the blood that soaked into the sands of that war-torn coastal region. It was the height of the conflict, and our mission was clear, hunt down Saddam Hussein. We were tasked with conducting a covert operation deep in enemy territory. My team and I were prepared for the dangers of war, but nothing could have prepared us for what we encountered. As we moved through the rugged terrain under the cover of darkness, tension hung thick in the air. We knew the risks, but we were determined to fulfill our duty. Suddenly, Amidst the eerie silence of the desert, we began to see them, ghostly apparitions of soldiers from battles long past. At first, we thought it was a trick of the mind, a side effect of the stress and exhaustion of combat. But as the figures drew closer, it became clear that these were no ordinary hallucinations. They appeared as Bedouins on camels, wielding old rifles that seemed to glow with an otherworldly light. Panic gripped our hearts as the apparitions advanced upon us. We opened fire, our bullets tearing through the air with deadly precision. But to our horror, the bullets passed right through the ghostly forms, as if they were nothing but wisps of smoke. In the chaos that ensued, we fought with every ounce of strength we possessed, but it was futile. The apparitions seemed invincible, their spectral forms unaffected by our weapons. It was as if we were battling against the very essence of war itself. With heavy hearts and wounded comrades, we were forced to retreat to our base, our minds reeling from the surreal encounter. We filed a report detailing the events that had transpired, but when our superiors reviewed it, they dismissed our accounts as the ravings of soldiers haunted by the horrors of war. But I know the truth. I know that what we faced in that coastal region was more than just a product of our imaginations. It was a glimpse into the dark heart of conflict, where the echoes of past battles lingered like restless spirits, forever haunting those who dare to tread upon the sands of war. This incident occurred on March 18, 2012, in the southern part of Fayette County in Pennsylvania. A man was walking his dog in a rural location at about 11.45 p.m. He was in the front yard and away from any lights when his attention was drawn to look upwards after hearing a whooshing sound coming from overhead. Flying above him at a distance of about 55 feet was a large flying creature that looked like a dragon. As the flying creature passed over an automatic dust to dawn light, the witness was able to get a good look at the strange flying animal. The body was about 22 feet long with a wingspan of about 18 feet wide, and looked to be shiny with almost a reflective body with no scales. The color was dark, possibly brown and red, similar to auburn brown. At the end tip of the wings there appeared to be talon-like fingers about 3 to 4 in number. The arms of the wing structure appeared muscular. The wings were quite thick, not like skin. There appeared to be a rear fin on both sides of its body, and the creature displayed an arrowhead-shaped tail. The witness also saw what appeared to be two extended rear legs. The creature had a cone shape around the head and it stopped flat on the base of the neck. The oddest physical feature that the witness mentioned to me was that the mouth and eyes were illuminated with, a very ominous orange glow. As the creature flew over a tree at the bottom of the yard and moved off in the distance, the fellow heard a deep throaty sound, similar to the foghorn on a boat. The entire observation lasted about 20 seconds. I used to be stationed in Fort Irwin in California. It's a long story, but there is a 30-mile road that leads from Barstow, the closet town, into the base which is in a large empty desert. There are dozens of crosses along the road leading into the base from soldiers and family of soldiers who have had accidents on this road throughout the years. Anyways, a buddy of mine who was my platoon mate and I were driving back from the mall in Virtovo one night. 
As we entered the starting stretch of Fort Irene Road I noticed some fresh bloody tire marks leading off the side of the road directly into a cross, which was dated something like August 11, 1989, this date was like August 11, 2006. Really creeped me out and I thought I was seeing things. About 20 minutes into our long drive down this isolated two-lane highway leading into the vast empty desert, I look over to my buddy who was driving and lip-syncing to some song. And then as we were going about 75 miles per hour, something darted out in front of us. I quickly caught a glimpse of what looked like a large humanoid beast with fur and a wet hairy face. It looked directly at us even though we were going 75 miles per hour and it was running right across his car. The thing was tall. At least 7 foot. Walking on two legs. But the eyes. The eyes were like. I don't know how to explain it, but for that split second when it turned to look at us. As it turned its body and I looked into its eyes it was like time slowed down and its eyes were white voids. Not a reflection really. More like dead light, Stephen King reference. And it wasn't a look of fear. But it was a look of I see you hello. It was the most skin crawling thing I have ever experienced. Whatever that was it was not human, not animal. It was sentient, but not. Not like we are. I won't say it had powers but whatever it did to us when we looked at it. I don't know. I turned to my friend who yelled out holy shit. And then the thing. It ran off to the other side of the highway. My buddy thought that we almost hit someone, so we stopped and got out to check, but whatever it was ran off into the empty desert night. And then he began to repeat large. Harry. Bird? No. No not bird. Bear. Bear. No. What? What was that? It took us about another 20 minutes to get to base and we just sat there, music off. Not talking to each other. He was quiet, which he was never quiet, not Brian. I tried to think of what to say, but we were too chill to really talk. Once we got back to base and told our squad members about what had happened, but no one believed us. That is until a few weeks passed by and I started hearing quiet murmurs from people who didn't want to speak openly, but they said that they too saw similar sightings. Years later, after I got out of the service, I did some research online and learned about native folklore passed down by indigenous Native Americans who claimed that Sasquatch was believed to live out in the barren salt flats. Google pulled up a lot of interesting information. Whatever it was. My friend turned white as a ghost that night and we never spoke of it to each other again. This bit is pretty damn creepy since, well, shit got messed up a while back. All I really can say from it, is F Ouija boards. Don't F with that shit. I'm currently on a Navy base. Live in an old building there it's from the 50s, and it's already condemned. Been that way a long while, but it's still in use since they can't keep up with demand, building's pretty shitty, has asbestos in it. Not cool. And some of my shipmates messed up not with alcohol like the CO is always hammering into us with speeches and competitions, or other shit like we hear at Chief's Call every week. No, what these guys did isn't the kind of shit that gets you chewed out by the LPO or anything like that. Nope. These dirtbags brought a Ouija board into the barracks and F all, they summoned some shit that I don't even know. It was a few nights ago, by that I mean a couple weeks, everyone on liberty, I was on duty so couldn't do shit. I was roving watch, basically, me and a partner walk around and do jack shit for a while, because while this place is old, nothing ever happens. I mean, I was the guy who reported the mold in the head, that's the navy term for a bathroom, on the far side, and that's about the most notable thing that happened. Other ships, er, barracks, namely integrated ones had interesting shit like seeing a couple screw behind a vending machine. None of that here. This is one of the last all-male barracks, until this night. Now for a little backstory. Yeah, it's a base, but this one's pretty storied. It's old. Really old. Opened in 1905. Thing is, though it's not just old. This base, has seen quite a bit of death. There's a lot of rules here written in blood. 
Some kid got hit by snow plow, so we have to wear PT belts after colors, that kind of shit. Well, the buildings right to our sides have had deaths and training accidents flying objects killing people in the GM building, some sailors getting shocked, then dying in their sleep the next day. Second deck, floor, of one of the buildings is said to be haunted by a chief from the 80s. And I've heard stories of dark ominous shadows in one of the other barracks. Our ship? Nothing though. Not really until rather recently. Well, this was the balls to 4 watch or rather midnight to 4 am. Yeah, it's tiring. Not fun being up at 2.40. But nothing out of the ordinary. Everything's fine. Too cold to rove outdoors, so we kinda had the rotation of picking one of the decks and checking the head, by that I mean go in there and waste time. Nothing unusual barely anyone was up so nothing was happening anyway, anything to pass the time, really. We ducked into a head on the first deck, and found a couple guys in there. So of course, despite the 11 general orders, started talking. One issue, they got drunk and decided in their wisdom to have brought a Ouija board back from wherever the F they had been. And were using it. In the head. At damn near 3 in the morning. Shit, right? What were they planning? Get their ass chewed by a chief of old? Maybe talk to Seaman Jimmy who pointed at the electron tube in the SPS-64 and got zapped by an arc of over 9000 volts? Didn't matter. I told them that they really shouldn't be doing that shit in the ship. They didn't listen and being entirely honest, using a Ouija board isn't against any of the rules, so I technically was out of jurisdiction despite being a watchstander. I told my partner to get the F out of there, we'd go to another one, but he was too intrigued by it. Well, F. They started, and rather quickly got a response. I can't remember what they asked, but shit got weird. First, the lights in the head went out. That's not normal the head always has lights on. There's no light switches in there either due to safety and security reasons. Only way to shut the lights off is by the breaker. Problem. I had checked the gear locker seconds ago no one in there, so it wasn't manually flipped and I had been watching the P-way so there's no way anyone slipped in. Of course, the breaker might have tripped on its own, since that's what breakers are meant to do. I took note of that and then checked. Nope, the breaker was fine. Lights in the head slowly came back on, so brown out? Maybe, but they stayed real dim and flickered. At this point the drunk guys were pretty freaked out. Being that my room was right next to the head, I asked the other rover to hold while I cut in to grab a notebook and pen. Shit was beginning to be weird and I had a responsibility to log it. As I was walking back to the head I heard a loud crash, which made me run over there. The drunkards had bolted. The other rover was pretty petrified. Apparently there was a clear voice, like it had come from the one MC saying one of the Ouija board user's name. It was deep and guttural. I didn't hear it, so I assumed they were messing with me, but f the look on those guys' faces was one of sheer horror. I couldn't get what the voice had said out of the other rover. He wouldn't say, but shit was only getting started. At this point, all the lights on the entire ship went out. I logged this, didn't catch the exact time since I don't wear a watch and didn't have my phone. Breakers were still good. They came back after about 5 seconds. We went to report, which was good, because the POOW was pretty freaked out. Something popped up on the cameras. Second deck. There was some contemplation on calling the base rover for this. BDO decided against it. Sent us to check. Nothing up there, but when we went up the ladder well, I swore I heard someone whispering from what sounded like the outside. Problem, that's a solid brick wall. Other rover heard it too. We went back, all conditions normal. F no they weren't. We hung out on the quarterdeck. Watched the cameras. There was something wrong. A dark shadow came out of the first deck head. Headed towards the back, went to the ladder well. We all saw it. It didn't look right at all. No way it was a bug on the lens or anything. It looked vaguely human. Then we all heard it. That blood-curdling scream. 
There was a loud scream coming from the head where those idiots messed with the damn board. We ran. Nothing in there. From where we were, there'd been no way anyone could have gotten in or out of the head without us noticing. We've had buds, basically seals who aren't seals yet. Or rather, BMs who don't know their rate yet, on the ship not even they are fast enough to have eluded eyesight there. The watch ended. I was officially done with that shit. I left a log of the events for my relief. And then to my horror, remembered that the head where all this occurred is right next to my room. I got in my rack like normal. Heard some strange noises. Coming from the direction of the head. I don't want to think about them. It's been a couple weeks. Been having trouble sleeping. Got my ass chewed for dodging leadership. Told to see a counselor. Went. I'm fine. Just a couple more weeks here. F this. F Ouija boards man. This is stressful enough. I don't need a haunting. Took a shower while writing this. No one else in the head. Lib just dropped. Most everyone in the line to leave. I didn't. Swore I heard something say my name. Problem. I heard my first name. No one says your first name here. Submariner here. There are few things as unnerving as being alone in the engine room from 23.30 to 5.30 during watch duty. When the boat is largely shut down in port, it becomes a very quiet place. The roving watches usually rush through their hourly log rounds, especially in the lower levels. During one particular in port period, the boat was moored in Pearl Harbor and a few people started complaining about feeling uneasy. I was on the mid-watch as the SEO in the evening, and a senior chief came back to do his required three-tour. We saw him walk past maneuvering on his way to Shaft Alley. This particular senior chief was the crusty old salt type, and he would usually spend some time just sitting in the lower levels of the engine room alone, contemplating life, so we expected as much. What we didn't expect was for him to literally run into the maneuvering area a few minutes later. The man was pale-faced and breathing heavily. We sat up straight, our eyes as wide as his, thinking we were about to announce and fight some ship casualty. He slumped into the EDO chair. A few tense and silent moments passed. We were on pins and needles. Finally, he opened his mouth and told us about the ghost in Shaft Alley. He swore that a sailor passed by him as he was sitting on a trash can in Shaft Alley. His first response was to call out to the guy, to see who it was. But then he realized this guy wasn't dressed right. He described what this guy was wearing, the old World War II naval uniforms. So he quickly got up to catch up to the guy, and he did. He caught up to him all the way aft. The guy turned towards the senior chief, looked right at him, then turned away and literally walked through the ass end of the boat. It was at that moment the senior chief decided it was time to leave Shaft Alley, and promptly did so. He swore up and down that he knew what he saw. I sure as hell wasn't about to leave maneuvering that night to find out for myself. It was between 12.30 and 1 a.m., on the morning of April 23, 2012, when a man heard an odd animal sound coming from outside. The sound was a level growl or screeching sound that he listened to for about five minutes. The sound seemed as though it was just outside the window. The witness, intrigued by the odd noise, awakened his wife to see if she could recognize what type of animal it might originate from. When his wife got up and they both heard the sound, she looked out the window across the road to a creek about 15 to 20 feet away. She then noticed what she thought was a deer standing up in the middle of the creek. Her husband questioned why there would be a deer standing in the creek, and why it be making such a strange noise. He then looked out the window and saw an undetermined creature dark brown in color and about the size of a deer. It could have been actually larger than a deer if it was peering over the retaining wall. The fellow said when it turned its head, it appeared to have an elongated face, almost deer-shaped, but not a stubby in the snout. It appeared to be more pointed in shape. What could be easily seen were two big round amber colored eyes that seemed to be glowing. 
The man estimated that they looked to be the size of a golf ball. He didn't think that they were reflecting as a result of some street lights some distance away. The witness commented that the freaky part was it was staring right at their house towards them. The couple noticed that whatever it was, the glowing eyes were staring directly in their direction. The man told his wife he was going out to check out what it was. Just then something very strange occurred. Suddenly the creature took one step, and took off into the sky at a 45 degree angle and was gone. The witness stated, the speed was insane. I never saw anything move that fast. He also stated that he never saw a bird that big and that he saw no signs of wings flapping. During a deployment to South America my SFA team encountered what I can only describe as a stealth-like hunter alien with dreadlocks. He killed us off one by one in the most efficient effortless manner. Keep in mind we were all seasoned operators out of Fort Bragg, pretty much all sexual tyrannosauruses. My CO was the only one who made it out alive after engaging the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat but eventually getting to the chopper. I have to preface this to provide context, and I'm tired and on my phone so this may be messy and kind of long, so I apologize. At the time, I was working nights in the munitions storage area, which is fenced off with barbed wire. The whole area is pretty spread out, with multiple buildings, and definitely large enough that you generally drove around to get to other buildings. Due to the nature of the job, the buildings are spread out with clear space between them. Anyways, the only people in the bomb dump on this night are roughly eight of us in my shop, and one guy in control that night. He was in another building and we had a direct line to him on what we called the bat phone, relevant later. This is summer in SC, around 2 or 3 AM, so the air was warm and very still. There was no breeze at all, and we had the break room door open while we watched a movie, we were on flight line support standby, and nothing was going on. Now, the rumor was the small building we worked out of had been built by German POWs during the war, and I know for a fact that there were some there back then. It was small, with a main break room, a small dispatch office through a doorway, and a couple of offices off of that one. There were two doors, one in the break room and one on the same side of the building in the dispatch office, roughly 20 to 30 feet away from each other. Both had push bars on the inside, but only the break room door could be opened from the outside, as the dispatch door's external latch was busted, and only the internal bar worked. Well, all of us, minus the guy locked down in the control building, for security, are in the break room when suddenly ka thunk, loud as shit, from the dispatch door in the next room. It was like someone was rushing through, slammed the push bar, and the door swung open, then swung back shut after a couple of seconds with a slam. We all looked at each other like WTF? And started to check it out. We had mag lights in our crew books, so a few guys grabbed them and swept around the building from both directions, another guy called the controller on the bat phone, who picked up and denied that he was messing with us. There was no way he could have messed with us and made it back to his phone in time, let alone doing it without being seen or heard. Anyone with experience knows how sound carries at 3 AM in the SC summer. You could hear the beeps from code keys being pressed hundreds of yards away, no joke. There was no way he could have hoofed it back to his building anywhere near fast enough, gone through the halls, punched in his code, and got to the phone in time. But the thing that got me was that damned bar. The door simply did not open from the outside, and we all heard that bar get pushed in hard the door swing open, hang there for a couple of seconds, then shut. And there was absolutely no breeze, and had there been, it would have blown past us sitting in front of the only other door. Weird. As an aside, there would be random times that I would go to pick up a trailer or something behind one of the other shops at the far end of the bomb dump, and as soon as I stepped out of my truck to do my inventory, I would get a super bad vibe. I'm talking the heebie-jeebies like no other, and as best I can describe it, it felt like something was right above and behind me, and just hated me being there. 
just seething anger, rage, and hate, and it wouldn't go away until about 15 minutes after driving away from that building. One night, another driver who had arrived there shortly before I had for a trailer asked if I had a weird feeling there, which sure as shit I did, so I know at least once someone else corroborated it. All of this was on the mid-shift, which was 11 to 7.30 am I heard a few other people's stories about weird shit that would happen at night, but since they aren't my stories, I can't vouch for their veracity. The only other thing that happened to me there was I swear I caught the clear silhouette of a guy walking in an open field between igloos. As I turned to punch my gate coat in, in the corner of my eye, I distinctly caught the motion of two legs and an arm sticking out, like someone mid-stride. When I turned back, it was just an empty field. That one could have just been my mind playing a trick, but man, that place could be creepy. It's been damn near 15 years, but still gives me chills to think about. Story happened to girlfriend's dad in 1975 on the border of Lithuanian SSR and Latvian Soviet Socialist Republic. So at the time there was a project called to go collect potatoes basically, take spoiled college kids, send them to do some labor on farms to get them some hands on experience. This happened to girlfriend's dad along with classmates, and they were sent an extremely rural, backwards area on the border of Lithuania SSR and Latvian SSR. So girlfriend's dad befriends another student sent, who actually was from this region. Instead of actually doing the labor, they instead, spend this time doing hikes, exploring, camping etc. One day, they go hiking into the woods, and go deeper and deeper, it starts to get dark, and they comes across a very old homestead, lights are on inside, so they think maybe was can crash here and they knock on the door. So they knock on the door, and an old man opens the door, he said oh you have arrived, I've been waiting for you, which is a polite way of saying come in. So they enter the house, instantly they noticed the house was filled with skulls, bones etc, weird, but could be hunter. But then they enter another room and there is a great feast, all set up, extremely lavishly, like a wedding according to friend's dad. The vibe apparently got very weird, very quickly, the old man said for them to join the guests and eat. The friend, who was a local to the region, apparently had some idea what was happening and told them they need to leave immediately, and so they got the hell out of there. That's all we know of the story so far, girlfriend is trying to get some more information about this story. Any idea what this feast was? The general tone is that this guy was some form of old pagan witch. What makes this also very interesting is that this was Soviet era, so definitely some underground thing. Edit. So got some more about the story from parents, the feast according to the friend, was called a ritual of calling, these events happened around September to October, and the region was called Plotile. The friend also called this man a witcher. So I would like to start this off by saying two things. One being if you have already started reading this please finish because I want to know if you have had a similar encounter, and two being that I don't intend to be rude whatsoever, I just don't care if anyone believes me or not. I know it would likely be hard for anyone to read an encounter story and instantly buy it, but I don't know how to state that I am not lying or over exaggerating any detail of this, every moment has been stained in my mind. So. With that being said I'm not going to go off on any tangents ABT why you should believe me, so let's start. About a two years ago, I was 13 almost 14 at the time, was still quite immature for my age, and enjoyed role playing as Mortal Kombat characters, fighting with my little brother who is now almost 13. By the way I live in Whitefish Montana, near a place called Olney, surrounded by woods pretty much. I also have horses basically everywhere on our property, is important info for later. Anyways, me and my little brother decided to go outside to the back of my house where there is a road that is about 400 feet in length leading up to I would say about 8 round hay bales, to pretend to fight each other with wooden swords we had custom detailed and made ourselves. 
I was cosplaying as Sub-Zero and my brother was just wearing regular clothes, and we started walking away from our house towards the hay bales because we intended to fight on them. Once we had gotten ABT halfway there which took like a minute, we were almost at the end of our horse pen that was fenced in next to our house reaching out halfway to the bales. I remember my brother leaning down to tie one of his shoes that had a messed up lace on the right one, and I am gonna get straight to the point as too many details ABT anything but what we both saw still makes me very nervous and sweat. I looked over at him and immediately heard a loud trampling or sprinting sound coming from the hay bale area. I looked up and at them, and I saw what I thought to be something resembling a human but was extremely tall, the hay bales were stacked two up, and I think four across, it was grayish white and ran behind the bales in what I assume a pretty much straight line, then going past them and disappearing into the woods that went from behind the hay all the way around my house, besides the main gravel road that brings you to the highway of course. I immediately freaked the F out, and tried to yell to my brother right beside me but only managed to basically talk super fast to him with an inside voice. He as well looked up very quickly because he had heard the running too. There was a small pause where my brother sounded confused, and the right as he did it came back running to the hay bales once again, stopping this time behind the third row, of two stacked on one another. It was so tall that we could both see almost the entirety of the thing's head, and then it ran kinda forward a little bit and then straight back towards the woods, never to be seen again. I want whoever that is reading to this point to know that this all happened in the span of about 5 to 8 seconds, and saying that whatever this was was running is a complete understatement. It had to be running at least 40 miles an hour, or fast enough where we could both barely make out what it looked like in detail, just the overall appearance. It looked to me as kinda like the rake but way taller and more slender looking and gray. I remember my brother yelling what the f and literally so do I as we full on bolted back to the house in probably 15 seconds. I got there first, yanked my brother in the door and slammed it harder than any other door I've slammed in my life, locking it. Of course, my parents didn't believe us at all, even though I was on the verge of either tears or a heart attack from the adrenaline. They said it was probably a moose. Hopefully I will get better answers here than from them but if not then that's okay I guess, and to be honest, I really do hope people believe me. It feels like a dream thinking back on it, just as it did the day after the incident. It's weird that I remembered this again suddenly today while watching a military crawler horror story on YouTube, probably because my mind blocks it out as a false memory or dream, even though I have a second eyewitness. If my brother wasn't with me I doubt I would ever believe what I saw. I was 18, 19 years old, a male if that matters. I was staying at my Mormon grandparents home with them, my uncle, and aunt living there. I slept on the couch. I was sitting on the sofa chair watching TV when what I thought to be a mosquito landed on me, so I immediately smacked it. I noticed the mosquito hadn't been squished, and for some reason, I felt compelled to pick it up and take a closer look. To my surprise, it had a human-like face, legs, arms, hands, feet, and an evil-looking gray color. I immediately showed my uncle and grandma. They both agreed that my grandpa needed to see it, so I put it in a Ziploc bag and zipped it closed. I also took a picture of it on my phone. Later. When my grandpa got home, I was ready to show him, but there was nothing in the bag, and my grandma and uncle were acting as if it never happened. The picture was gone also. I forgot about that night until a few months later, and now I am sharing it. Throughout all of it, and even now thinking of it and talking about it, makes me feel uncomfortable and afraid. They are evil, at least these ones. I'm not necessarily religious or was at the time, but I believe there's a God. I hope I don't sound crazy. I was just tidying my room and out of the corner of my eyes I saw what I thought to be a very tiny dragonfly. This wouldn't be uncommon in my room because my bedroom windows face a creek and I often find dragonflies in and around the house. Being curious like I am, I switched my lights on to get a good look and it was gone, 
I looked everywhere for this dragonfly, behind the curtains I saw it flying towards, moved furniture around, I went crazy trying to find this dragonfly and it was just not there. What has me wondering about it possibly being a fairy, is the way it was flying super close to the ground and as soon as I looked at it, it just vanished. My bedroom windows were all closed at the time so if it was a dragonfly it couldn't have escaped and I think I would have found it again with all the searching I did. I'm going a bit crazy over it cause I can't find this supposed dragonfly in my room and now I'm dead curious to know what I saw. In the summer of 2022, my last camping trip with my family, we went to a popular camping location in Ohio. If you can figure it out, bonus to you. My sister and I me, 17 at the time, and her, 14 at the time, shared a tent so we stayed up giggling and messing around quite a bit like Uno or talking about boys she liked. Mostly for week one and the two week trip it was fine, we slept and talked like normal. Until the second week where things took a turn. I have a really hard time with sleeping so when week two strolled around my sister would be passed out asleep and I'd be sitting wide away for hours at a time. While these hours where I sat awake I heard noises, crunching, shifting, growling, howling. The basic outdoor noises. For the next two days of week two I heard a lot of walking and talking in the woods, things like come here or help me sometimes I'd hear faint whispering near my tent. I was honestly scared shitless. On the last two nights which probably had been the worst, my sister was awake, both of us playing Uno with her phone dead and mine on a cool 20%. Around maybe 2am my sister went to lay down and so did I until I heard thick footsteps around the tent, too heavy for deers or wolves but too light for bears or elk. It was almost like a person was walking around my tent. My sister was awake and quietly watched as someone or something pressed on the tent sides and door. Now my sister and I move all the little tent zippers into our tents at night to keep people from trying to get in. Clearly this person or thing was looking for said zippers. So we felt pretty smart. This was night 4 of week 2. Now finally week 2 night 5. The same heavy footsteps the same touching at the walls and the same whispering to come here and come out. My scared booty waited until 5 a.m. where I sat outside waiting for my grandma. While sitting out I heard whispering and then screaming, the scariest most blood-chilling scream in the world. It sounded like some kind of animal or person or something, but it was so loud I nearly peed myself. I was glad we left and even happier to not go back for two years. Does anyone know what this is? Or if it was some dude lurking on our campsite? Update 1. Talked grandparents and as they said tater tot their little American shepherd at the time has been snarling at something outside the tent walking around, whatever it was got scared and let out a husk growl and ran away. It was about 3 am for them and it scared them. I apologize for the late update I was asleep. This story takes place about a year and a half ago, so my mind is a bit fuzzy but it was one of the most strange and weirdest events I've experienced. At the time of this story, I was a freshman in college. I am a very introverted person and have only made a few friends throughout my time in college, about three or four. Also, at the time, I had a bit of a fishing phase where I loved fishing. I still do, but at the time, I loved to fish almost every day. I only really fished for common freshwater fish, bass, sunnies, a few catfish, etc. I was looking to go for something bigger. I was looking to catch carp. My college campus does have a lake and stocks it for students to fish from. My school isn't near a gas station, shopping center, or anything of the sort, so I couldn't just walk to get fishing supplies, and I didn't have a car either, so I was really only dependent on what I brought from home. Carp are also very sloppy fish, so they will eat just straight up food anything that can produce a pungent odor, so I would just get some food from the dining hall, and whatever I didn't finish, I would fish with. Carp also prefer wet, sticky, rainy, or overcast weather and are more active during the darker parts of the day. 
I sat in my room bored around 6 37 ish when I started hearing raindrops on the window. I didn't immediately go straight to fishing, rather, I just went to the dining hall at dinner and came back with leftovers to retrieve my rain jacket, boots, and fishing gear. I was taking my time, so by the time I arrived at the lake, it was about 8. Now, this lake is a pretty modest size, you could see probably 90% of it regardless of where you stand. Three quarters of it is bare grass where a walking path walks by, while the remaining bit is trees and other brush. I stood on a bank and threw my line in the water. Leaning against a tree, I couldn't go on my phone because of the rain, so my attention was focused on my line until something caught my attention. I spotted a person, or at least what I assumed to be a person, right on the outer edge of where the trees and brush begin. Now it was a rainy night, and street lamps don't stretch to where they were standing, so take what I say with a grain of salt, but they were wearing light white colored pants, a big black sweatshirt, and no shoes, just what appeared to be socks. They were standing in a very marshy, swampy area as well, I should mention. If they weren't getting completely soaked from the head down with rain, well, they were getting soaked from the feet up with mud. There was also some black box with a small white light coming out of it, which pierced through the night insanely bright, though it was a very small light, I'd assume a quarter inch big from where I was standing, but the amount of power it had was incredible. They would walk back and forth from the edge of the lake, look at the lake, and skip or dance back behind a tree multiple times all the while picking up this small cube and pointing the light in the direction of different areas, going back behind the tree, revealing at the lake's edge, skip back behind, reveal themselves to move the box, go back behind the tree, and do this all over again. I watched them do this multiple times, making my presence known by making noise and such, but at this point, I was more entrenched by them rather than my fishing. It wasn't until they went back behind the tree, this time walking normally, stayed behind it for an uncomfortable amount of time before walking slowly to the lake's edge and, like they had a sixth sense, looked directly at me. However, from the only light emitting on them, I could only see a metallic shiny silvery sheath covering their entire face. No holes cut out for eyes or mouth. You may think it could be a clear face protector, but I saw what I saw. They stood there, almost staring into my soul for about 30 seconds, not once did I look away, I don't even think I blinked. But they turned, and I saw them walk into the brush, leaving that small cube on the ground, and they walked down to what I assumed the walking path, which would have led down to the trail I was standing on. I went to my tackle box and grabbed my pocket knife from my pocket hoping I wouldn't have to use it, though I didn't know I wouldn't have to. As I felt that light shine on my face from the cube, I immediately looked up and it was facing me. I had had enough. I packed up everything quickly, and as I was walking back towards my dorm, I heard manic footsteps, very much bare footsteps. I ran back the staircase leading back to the main campus but not without looking down the foot trail. I saw what was my final look at that figure. They were sprinting in the opposite direction of me with their arms up in the air, not screaming or anything. I got back to my dorm safe and sound. Nothing happened the rest of the night, but I returned to the lake early the next morning before my classes, and I found what appeared to be horse hoof footprints, though very exaggerated points on the top, in the shape of a bloated V. I saw the wear in the grass the thing left going back and forth behind the tree. I didn't find that black box either. Normally I would say that this may be some drunk or high student, but that doesn't explain their extremely weird behavior, those weird footprints in the drying mud, or that shiny face that pierced my soul. I'm not sure what I meant that night, but I'm not sure I want to know. Pretty quick but basically he has this story that one time him and his friend were driving in Elkton, Maryland on a road. This was a good 25 plus years ago. Then 5 seconds later they were on the other side of the canal in Delaware. Which was about 30 minutes away from the road they were on which made no sense. They looked behind them and the road was just covered in dust like a dry dirt road. 
They both were not drinking or doing drugs. Both had the same recollection of that happening. Both agreed it made absolutely no sense they were here. And both actually went to therapy for it for a short time. But nothing ever came of it. My dad has this story he always says that when he was about 10 to 12 years old. They were en route 13 in Dover, Delaware which is home to Dover Air Force Base. But about 40 to 45 years ago him and his parents were driving, and there was about 20 plus cars all stopped on the road. Getting out their car and looking up to which looked like the Batmobile just floating there stationary, for a minute or two. And then just flew off. Everyone insisted it was a UFO but cameras weren't really a thing at the time I guess. My grandparents said they could confirm it happened and a bunch of witnesses saw it too but the witnesses were strangers at the time and they couldn't find any newspapers or anything about it anywhere. Wondering if anyone out there knows about it this too. Could have been the Air Force Base aircraft but the way 20 plus random cars were parked on Route 13 along with him and my grandparents all starring in shock makes it interesting. So around 2007 to 8 placing me around 5 years old possibly 6. I was still in one of those transforming cribs with a portions that could drop down and turn it into a toddler bed. This left the bed rather high off the floor. At the time I lived in southern Arizona. Late in the night very early stages of the morning 0 to 3. I was awoken by something grabbing at my ankle feeling long sharp nails like stiletto style nails from the now fragmented memories I still have of the night the thing looked like a stereotypical witch. Wrinkled wart riddled face with long nose and rotting teeth. It never spoke but did manage to pull me off my bed and under it. It startled me understandable so. It put a single finger up to its lips in the shushing motion. It never changed and simply vanished from sight as the sun began to rise. I guess I was so freaked out I never spoke about it. It wasn't some weird dream based on a memory as at the time I wasn't a huge fan of any media with witches and was a pretty hard set Lilo and Stitch kid already. I'm reaching out to share a peculiar and unsettling series of events that have left me searching for answers, and perhaps more importantly, for others who might have experienced something similar. It's a story of days so anomalously bad that they defy simple explanation, marked by a series of technological failures and personal challenges that seem to transcend mere coincidence. Just over a year ago, I experienced a day that was unusually disruptive. Despite starting the day with a positive mindset and no anticipation of trouble, everything began to go awry. My work with technology, which is usually within my control and goes smoothly, suddenly became a nightmare. Specifically, my cluster's nodes began to DDoS each other, leading to a cascade of breakdowns. Attempts to engage in ordinary coding resulted in failures where none should logically exist, code that worked flawlessly the day before simply stopped functioning. Efforts to address these issues only compounded the problems, turning the day into a series of escalating technological crises. This day was notably peculiar, not just because of the technological anomalies, but because it seemed to actively counteract every attempt at productive work, leading me to eventually cease all efforts and resign myself to doing nothing. The day's conclusion was marked by a personal tragedy, the sudden death of my brother under very distressing circumstances. Fast forward to exactly one year later, without any prior recollection of the date or anticipation of trouble, I found myself once again ensnared in a web of unexplainable difficulties. Attempting to retrieve an important video, I accidentally formatted the DVR, a mistake that is uncharacteristic of me, given my meticulous nature with technology. This was followed by over 12 hours of unsuccessful recovery efforts, a botched attempt to fix shades, and a myriad of other issues that seemed to compound, echoing the chaos of the year before. It's this pattern of recurrence, happening precisely one year apart, that has compelled me to seek understanding and shared experiences. On both occasions, 
my approach to the day was marked by a willingness and readiness to work, unaffected by any prior expectation of difficulty. Yet, the unfolding of events seemed almost scripted in its capacity to derail productivity and peace of mind. I'm reaching out to this community to ask, have any of you experienced similar patterns of recurring difficult days, where the array of challenges faced seems beyond statistical coincidence or psychological expectation? How do you interpret or deal with such days? This isn't just about seeking explanations, it's about finding solidarity and perhaps a way to navigate or mitigate these occurrences. Any insights, theories, or personal stories you're willing to share would be greatly appreciated. Thank you for taking the time to read my story. I look forward to any thoughts or shared experiences you might offer. Hello everyone, I've always wanted to post my story here, but am not very articulate so I haven't done it until now. I want to tell my story because hopefully it can stop young girls or boys from being harmed. By the way my name is Sarah. So when I was 17 years old my family and myself moved to a new area which meant I had to quit my old job. I always wanted to work to be able to support my coffee and shopping addiction so I was very eager to find a new job, but this time I wanted something that paid more. I thought I was way too smart to accept minimum wage so I started applying to be a receptionist at some vet clinics in the area and some other lower level receptionist jobs. I don't know why I thought I would be able to get a job like this while in high school, all I can say is I was an ambitious kid. I was on Indeed and would also drive to locations to fill out applications, but I wasn't getting any call back so I became frustrated and turned to Craigslist. My mother told me over and over again to not go on that website and I watched the Craigslist killer movie, I knew how stupid this was, but I was 17 so I thought I was invincible. I applied at a few more receptionist jobs and vet clinics that I made sure were reputable places. I received one call regarding my Craigslist applications. It was from a man who sounded very professional and told me that he had just started a company and needed a receptionist which already sent red flags off in my mind because I had not filed out an application for any new companies. I asked him what the name of the company was and he dodged my question, but I was still very interested. I wanted to make good money. He told me that I had a really nice voice which I thought was good because if I was going to be working as a receptionist I should have a good phone call voice, he also said that I was beautiful which I blushed at at the time. He told me that he would love to meet for an interview that day and I was very excited. I grabbed a pen and paper and asked him where his company was and he said they hadn't moved into their building yet which was a little strange, but I said no problem where would you like to meet. They'll have my mom drive me and he started to act a little off when I mentioned my mother. He said no need to bother your mother he'll pick you up. That sentence was the point where I knew I was talking to a bad guy but I still tried to reason it in my head because I really wanted this job. I had been applying for months and this was the first call I received. So I said to him no that's okay my mom will drive me, she wouldn't want me getting into a car with a man I don't know. And that's when he started telling me that the only way we could do it is if he could pick me up. He started getting annoyed and said that there were so many women applying for this job so he needed to get an answer as soon as possible. He also started telling me all the opportunities I would be missing out on. At that point I was very conflicted and asked if I could give him a call back in a moment and he sighed and said yes, but don't make me wait. I hung up the phone and was relieved to be done with that conversation. I went to my mom's room and explained everything to her and she lost her mind. She said, Sarah that guy is some pervert don't call him back. And then she proceeded to look up the police station number because she wanted to report him to the police. I was embarrassed and begged her not to. He proceeded to call me over and over again after I hadn't responded. I didn't want to talk to him again so I texted him and said no thank you to the offer. He lost his mind. I received so many text messages along the lines of dumb bitch I have so much money I could have taken care of you I know where you live act. For weeks after this incident I felt so guilty because I thought I put my entire family's life in jeopardy. 
I had a hard time sleeping and I rejected any interviews immediately because I thought they could have been him using another person to bait me out of my house. I wish I would have allowed my mom to call the police because I think he was going to do something really messed up. I sell everything from car parts, cars and tools to appliances and collectibles on Craigslist, so I get a mix of people that nobody wants to imagine. A few highlights would be me selling a car that I told the guy overheated and shut off after running for 5 to 10 minutes. We left it to idle while we talked, he asks for a test drive around the block and I said okay. Now, he had come with another guy with a truck and who hauled dolly, which we agreed to unhitch and put in a spot that it couldn't be quickly rehitched so that he could load the car and go. Keep in mind, this was an 80s Camaro with a full straight pipe and no plates. I watched the test driver hauling us down the hill while trailer guy sat in his truck, and truck guy picked up his phone and then sped off. Keep in mind, he didn't have the trailer. Long story short, the Camaro broke down at the end of my street after the driver tried to run off with it, and trailer guy left the trailer in front of my house, and due to their stupidity I took pity and returned the trailer to U Hall and didn't persuade it. The level of stupidity of trying to drive off in a car that the owner told you would break down as soon as it got hot is impressive. Another good one was the truck bed cap I was selling for a long bed ranger. The guy came to my house in a short bed ranger, paid me, we put it on, it was obviously too long, and he asked if he could borrow a sawzall. I let him, and he proceeded to hack the last 18 inches of it off, hand the saw back, shake my hand thank me and drive off. That was a new one. Other gems include people insisting that 8 lug Ford truck rims would fit on their vehicles that did not have 8 lug axles, my TV sales story somewhere else in the thread, a guy buying a rust free tailgate then coming bam with a rotted out one a day later yelling claiming that it was broken and rotted out and that I ripped him off, a few people showing up to my house and trying to walk off with things and one guy who probably purchased an appliance off of me stealing the washer and dryer out of my truck while I ate lunch at Wendy's that were both broken that I was on my way to scrap. Oh Craigslist, how I love thee. On the buyer's end, I had a guy try to sell me a Honda Civic that had four different VIN numbers, and a very obviously swapped dashboard VIN plate. The car, when run on Carfax according to the dashboard, was a red 2002 Civic Coupe, Year may be wrong, I don't remember precisely, but the car was a 2001 grey four-door. It had all of the signs of a very obvious bad chop shop job, and was in a bad part of town. I told the police, and it was in fact stolen and I dodged a bullet. Sold an expensive fully tested aquarium light on Craigslist once $300 cash. Sweet. Email comes through guy would like it dropped off as he was a college student and didn't have a car. Being freshly out of college I sympathized and said sure he lived in Boston 45 minutes away. Not only did this mother f live in Boston, he lived on Newberry Saint in Boston the vestibule to his apartment complex had a crystal chandelier. But I digress. The buyer comes out and meets me and invites me in where he says he only has 200 bucks and asks if that's okay. I'm obviously pissed. He hits up his roommate for the extra Benjamin who puts out without a fight I am now onto his shit. I take my money and go collect my illegally parked car for this transaction. The only perk is I'm in the second nicest neighborhood in Boston. I haul my SUV the 45 minutes back to my house. No sooner do I get home and I get a text from this mother f. He wants me to come back to Boston to refund him because the LED moonlights on this aquarium light have burnt out. I tested it before posting and delivery LEDs worked fine. LEDs don't burn out magically. I'm a good guy, if I sold something that was damaged I would probably work something out with the buyer, but really? F this guy. I ignore this guy's message, mother F blows up my phone with texts for the next 3 days. 10 of 10 would tell him to go F himself next time.
When I was 21 I tried to kill myself by taking half a bottle of Xanax and posting an ad to Craigslist asking for someone to come get me. Someone did. He took me back to his place and as soon as he gave me a glass of wine I knew something bad was going to happen, but I'd asked for it. Well, I hadn't asked for it, but I'd made a CL posting saying I took a bunch of pills and need someone to get me. I was practically comatose and only vaguely remember but he proceeded to date our me and beat the shit out of me. To be fair, I hated my life so much at that point I wasn't even mad. And to his credit, had he not kept me up all night raping and beating the shit out of me I might have died. At the end of it he threw me unceremoniously in a shower and showed me all the bruises and wealth he gave me before driving me home. I never pressed charges. I'm not even mad about it. But, I became aware of how messed up the people of Craigslist can be that night. Had he not saved my life, it would have been a complete horror story. Mine is just kinda sad. I adopted a dog, my first ever dog adoption, my husband has his own that he got long before we met. I'd spent a long time picking out the perfect dog from our local shelter and thought I'd found him. It ended up not working out, turned out he didn't like my cats despite being okay with the cats at the shelter, and it was causing a lot of havoc in our home as he couldn't be left alone anywhere near them. I reluctantly advertised him on Craigslist with a rehoming fee and was very picky about who I would let him go to. This woman emailed me a few times and begged me to hold him for her so she could meet him. I sent her photos and she said things along the lines of it was meant to be and finding him is a dream come true, you know, the kind of stuff overly enthusiastic dog lovers say about dogs. She clearly adored dogs so I agreed to hold the dog a couple more days so she could meet him. She cancelled the day she was supposed to come, but begged me to let her reschedule in two days time. I agreed, but let her know other people were interested. Two days passed and she cancelled again, spinning a story about her brother's car breaking down and her having to loan him money. I told her I couldn't hold him any longer but I appreciated her interest. All of a sudden she was on her way. She turned up at my house at around 11pm and told me she would take him then and there, that she didn't need any time to see if they would bond as it felt right. He kept barking at her, which I found weird because he never barked but she seemed over the moon about it. When it came to getting the rehoming fee she told me she didn't have it so we agreed that she would come by the following weekend once she got paid again. The day before she was due to bring the rehoming fee she started sending me texts accusing me of lying about him being house trained. I assured her he'd never gone to the bathroom in my home and that he actually seemed to only ever want to pee on my lawnmower and spring onions. I told her he was probably just adjusting to being in a new home with other dogs. She wasn't happy about my response, but I don't know what she wanted me to do. The day she was supposed to bring the fee over I got a knock on the door from the animal cops. She'd reported him as a found, stray dog, claimed he had bitten her after she had struck him. Zand he had been captured and was taken to be quarantined. His microchip had shown my address. I cried as the animal cops took my statement and I gave proof that she had in fact adopted him from me, not found him. They were pretty pissed off at her too at this point. He went to the shelter and passed his week in quarantine but, due to a mix-up or lack of organization, he was euthanized anyway. It broke my heart and I sent the woman a text letting her know what had happened. Her boyfriend responded with a drunken, immature comment and then I was bombarded by texts from her over the next couple of days, saying how awful she felt and how she couldn't sleep at night. The animal cops ended up filing a report against her for filing a false report to them about the dog, and she ended up being cited. So yeah, never again will I put an animal on Craigslist. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.